There is a word from the Lord, and I want to be obedient to what God has placed on my heart. The Old Testament book of 1 Samuel, chapter 13. 1 Samuel, one verse there, and then we'll pick up in Acts 13. 1 Samuel 13, Old Testament, 1 Samuel 13, verse 14. Amen. God is good all the time, isn't he? 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14. 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14. But now your kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has appointed him a ruler over his people because you have not commanded, you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. The Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. Then turn with me quickly to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13 verse 22. Acts Chapter 13, verse 22, real quick. After he had removed him, he, God, raised up David to be their king concerning whom God had also testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. Amen. I want to lift the subject, a man after God's heart. Amen. You may be seated. A man after God's own heart. If you read carefully, in 1 Samuel 13, God said, I'm looking to find a man after mine own heart. In Acts chapter 13, God speaks again and says, I found a man after my own heart a man after God's heart. It represents a captivating, compelling, riveting, fascinating phrase, a man after God's heart. In its simple yet significant formulation, it clearly refers to integrity, virtue, character, and singleness of focus. Spiritual, saved, dedicated, consecrated, anointed men should crave this phrase as descriptive of their walk with God. Humbly, I want to be known as a man after God's heart. Take away accomplishments, take away accolades, take away titles, take away enconiums, take away reputation, take away secular acclaim, but leave me with my walk with God and all will be well with my soul. More than God's hand, more must pursue God's heart. In his hand, we seek things, cars, clothes, cash, commodities. On the other hand, in his heart, we seek purpose, proximity, power, and perspective. You and I need to determine today, do we want what's in God's hand, or do we want God's heart? David was many things, and I'm sure many people would argue that David should not be spoken of as a man after God's own heart, and we'll get into it, but David failed miserably. But the reality written large over David's life is that God said about him, he is a man after God's heart. Oh, I wish I had time to just tell you that it doesn't matter what people say about you. It does matter what God knows about you. And God said, despite all of his mess-ups, despite all of his adversity, despite all of his perplexity, despite all of his failures, he's still a man after God's heart. I'm concerned about this because many times we believe, well, if a scoundrel like David, a rascal like David, a miscreant like David, a sinner like David, if he can be a man after God's own heart, it seems like God is lowering the standard. 
Now, real quick, real quick, this is about 30 seconds. If there is no standard in Christianity, it would just seem like 5,000 people every Sunday would just say, since there's no standard, I just want to be in church because there's nothing here special. I just want to be in a place where there are no rules, where there are no regulations, where I don't have to live like anything. It would just seem like that, but sinners know there is something unique about the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. People are not running to the church because there are no standards. People, I believe, will come because they've heard about Jesus. And when they hear about Jesus, he said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. So this standard matter, when it comes to David, it's still troubling. Because there are believers who are standard bearers. They don't recognize that God says, I got you on standards. But if I, if I stipulate to standards, then no one can stand, preach pastor. If I put it up there so high and say, only if you reach this standard, then no one qualifies. And because he knew that no one qualifies, he sent his son Jesus. Oh, I feel the, the, the Holy Spirit in this place. So, so it is that I want to unpackage this phrase. In 1 Samuel 13, Saul, the first king, had moved rashly. Samuel, the prophet, told Saul, the king, wait for me, and God will do some unusual things. But, but Saul was impatient, and Saul did something that would seem trivial. He took it upon himself to develop a burnt offering. When Samuel came, immediately afterwards, Samuel said, what did you do? And Saul said, well, I made a decision. Samuel said, what did I tell you to do? Wait for me. What did you do? I made a decision. And Samuel said, you think it's small, but God is in the detail. And God wants somebody who will follow him, who will obey him, who will do it as he says to do it. And for that, Saul, your kingdom has been removed. And now the Lord is looking for a man after his own heart. Now, you need to contrast Saul, the first king of Israel. Saul had size. He looked like a king, stood like a king, spoke like a king, acted like a king. The people said he ought to be our king. But God said, I'm looking for a man after my heart. While the people were looking at Saul and his size, God saw David and his substance. God saw David and his spirit. And brother, you need to ask the question, is it about size? Is it about strength? Is it about stamina? Or is it about substance and spirit and soul? So then Paul picks it up because God's still looking. And Saul says, I want to take you back in Acts 13 through your history. He speaks to them as comrades in faith. He speaks to them as a part of the Jewish family. And he says, you remember that God chose us. God delivered us from Egypt. God planted us in the land. And then God started looking for a man. Had a king, but he was not what God wanted for his people. So God started looking. God, you, you got you to imagine that, that, that God is looking. Now, 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 this is an anthropomorphism, big word. It simply means we're just using it as if God is like a man. Because God already knew that Saul would fail. He had David in mind even before. See, the people chose Saul. God chose David. 
Mm. We make choices, but our choices are not always in line with God's choice. Be that as it may, in Acts 13, Paul gives them their history, and Paul says, I want you to recognize that, that, that God chose a man. Israel's first king, handsome, rugged, muscular, well-beloved, Saul had all the external features, yet he was lacking in the spiritual realm. Saul disobeyed on several occasions. He showed his spiritual immaturity. The people wanted him, however. They were impressed with his size, but God summed it up in 1 Samuel 16, 7 and said, while man looks at the outward appearance, watch me, he said in 1 Samuel 16, God looks at the heart. Hmm. A man after God's heart. Again, not God's hand, but God's heart. Many people want what's in God's hand, but there are few who want what's in God's heart. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful if God judged the way you and I judge. Come on now, wouldn't we really like God to beat up the people we don't like? Make bad things happen in the lives of people we don't particularly like? And then we want God to really bless some people. We give God some candidates for blessing. He ought to be blessed. She ought to be blessed. Look at all they've gone through. Lord, you know you ought to bless them. We, we, we're not always selfish. We really would believe some people deserve some blessings. Look how we think. You know, after all he's been through, he ought to receive some good things. So I'm not saying everybody is envious or jealous. Some people really would like to see some other people blessed on the basis of what they believe the person has gone through. But I want to ask you, does God judge as we do? No. So the next time you decide who ought to have a blessing, recognize that God looks at the heart. I, I want to examine a heart for a few moments, heart. I'm not speaking of that organ in our body. I'm not speaking of that muscle that pumps blood throughout our bodies. I'm, I'm talking deeper, heart. You and I speak of heart in many ways. Can I run down a few? If you know something by memory, you say, I know it by, okay. Uh, when a person puts all their effort into it, you say he did it with all his. If a person, if an athlete plays and he or she even, he particularly plays and he is hurt, you will say that took a lot of. Amen. You, you see where I'm trying to go? If it's a mediocre effort, you say that was half hard. But we're still not talking about what I'm talking about, this heart. God was looking for a man after his heart. So many people are trying to figure out what heart is about. Heart, the trajectory of a relationship of faith. Heart, tracing the walk with God. Heart analyzing whether or not we are in right relationship with the Heavenly Father, heart. When we engage in heart talk, we enter the realm of the Spirit. We're intent on describing a conversion experience. The heart, I need to tell you, belongs to God. I wonder, has your heart been changed? Has your heart been transformed? Has your heart been reoriented? Has your heart been made new? Has your heart been washed in the blood of Jesus? Has your heart been made alive? Because if so, then we're on the same wavelength. David was a man after God's own heart. This phrase arrested me. This phrase seized me. A man after God's heart. Not perfect. Because there are enough people who know David was not perfect. Shattering experience in his life. 
He failed God. He failed himself. He failed all that he had been taught. Taking another's wife wrong. Having relations wrong. Committing himself wrong. Having the husband killed wrong. So, Pastor, that ought to disqualify him. Well, yes. And no. Because I'm still left with God is searching for a man. And then Acts 13, Paul says, God has found a man. You, you, you say, all right, who, who did God find? Well, the reality is he found an unlikely man. He found someone that had probably been written off by other people. Hmm, I wish I could preach on how people can be written off by other people. How you can just decide low down, no good, never amount to anything, never make a difference, no comeback from setback. No second act greater than the first act. No long playing movie greater than the ugly snapshot. That's what happens to many of us. You, you, your life is captured in one moment, the worst moment of your life, the failure, the, 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 the loss, the poor judgment. And more and more, I read an article this football player, prominent football player, had acknowledged having an affair and fathering a child, and they recounted all of the sports figures who had had a similar issue. And they said in the article, this was no Christian article, this was just a regular secular newspaper. It said, another one goes down. Now it did give all of his statistics it did say that he won this Super Bowl and he had won that Super Bowl. But the point was, it just seems like people will say, fine, all of that. We'll put that in the later paragraphs for the people who read the whole story. But for the ones who just read the first few sentences, we'll start with the transgression. And that's how life is. But if you and I could get God to say, I'm through, then that would be fine. But let me give you just a little window into how David was a man after God's own heart. Now, all of that I told you that he did, and he did. And it was wrong. He failed God. But let me tell you, he was a sweet musician. And David was thinking about how he had failed God, and he was writing psalms that we sing today, psalms of praise. And David said in Psalm 51, Be gracious unto me, O Lord, for I have sinned. Now let me tell you what happens to too many people. Well, Lord, if not for that allure, if not, my guard was down. I was weak. It was a bad moment. And we give God all of this to say why we did what we did. David said, I tell you what, I failed you. Now, you and I say, uh-uh, no, it ought to be worse than that. No, uh-uh, uh-uh, just can't say some words. And God says, no, I know heart. And that's a man after my heart. That's a man who wants to be right with me. That's a man who wants to walk in relationship to me. That's a man who wants to walk in harmony with me. Well, if you just quickly say, I confess, but you can, that doesn't change anything. Well, let's go. Okay. I want to ask you to take a heart test with me. A heart test. Now, when the doctor asks and says, we're going to give a heart test, he's talking about your stamina. He's talking about run a little bit and let me check how your heart does on this. But I have a different heart test. Here's some questions from a heart test. Number one, is God the center around which you live? Heart test. Question two, does sensitivity to the kingdom of God, characterize your life. Heart test. 
after adversity, loss, and failure, do you yet honor, love, and reverence God? Heart test. Does the name of the Savior, Jesus, resonate in your be being? Heart test. After all you've experienced, do you still say that God is your all in all? Heart test. After prayer, the word, worship, witnessing, are these the ways to deeper life in Christ? Heart trick test. Can you trust God when all hell breaks loose in your life? Heart test. I got great news. David aced the heart test. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. All of that that he did, I mean, that's just low down. Take a man's wife and then put him on the front line. Know that when he goes into battle, he'll die. And yet you say he's a man after God's own heart. The Bible says it. If I tried to say it, it would take a long time to prove it. And it would seem like, see, you just want to lower the standard. You know how we come up with that. Oh, the, the church, we like to get beat up every now and then in church. Church is real good when you say, oh, your old sinner's in the church, and God can't do nothing with the church till he clean up the church. And we, we start working on cleaning up the church, and that's true. But that's just half of the story. God says, while, while I'm cleaning up the church, I wish I had just about five people, because let me tell you, when we start pulling up stuff, God said wheat and, tar and chaff look the same. God said wheat and tar look the same. Leave them alone. Let them both come up together, because what you think you're pulling up, you might be pulling up some wheat. But if there was discipline in the church, somebody would say something. Let the Holy Spirit do his work. Let some people think they're getting away with some stuff. Let some people think they're fooling people. Let some people think that their spirituality is fooling some people. But the test of time, time will tell a whole lot of things. You, you know, you just ought to just wait a little bit. Just wait and see how it's going to come out. Don't, don't, don't predict. Don't bet. Don't prognosticate. Don't, I think I'm, I, I see how it's going to come out. No, just wait and let it unfold. And David was a man after God's own heart, I would submit, because David knew how to confess to God. And if you want to rip 1 John out, because it sounds like the, the policy that, that a believer can just, I'll just claim 1 John 1 and 9. If I confess with my mouth, believe in my heart that God, I mean, you know, confess, uh, uh, God is faithful and just to forgive and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. It sounds so simple. But when you want God's heart, you don't want to break the heart of the one you love. I wish I, I, I wish I had one witness. You don't want to break the heart of the one you love. And David was a man after God's own heart. He aced the, the heart test. He said, if I go through something, I'm running back to God. When I've gone through some tight places, I'm running back to God. When I failed God, I'm running back to God. When I've been up and then fell down, I'm running back to God. Is there anyone today who is after God's own heart? Now, everybody shouldn't take the heart test. Because some of history's greats couldn't take the heart test. Aristotle, Plato, Socrates couldn't take the heart test. They could take the mind test. But they couldn't take the heart test. The Bible says the heart is deceitful and wicked. Who can know it? Paul said, I couldn't pass the heart test. Wait a minute, Paul. You wrote half of the New Testament. But before Christ came to my life, I was the chief among sinners. I couldn't take the heart test. Now, you're looking at me, and you, you feel you could take the heart test. But before you do, let me tell you that our righteous ways amount to filthy rags in the sight of God. That's Bible, church. That somebody says, I think I could take the heart test. I think my heart is right with God. But some negative comes into your life and you fall all apart. 
See, it's not when things are well that we judge. Shouldn't judge at any time, but you really, you judge an individual if you're going to judge when things break down, when systems break down. Listen to me. If everything is right, bills are paid, money is there, health is intact, then a lot of people say, give me the test. That's not the time. The time is when you've just gone through some stuff. And when you start speaking negative and when you start resign, I guess just ain't nothing going right. How many times have I said, if you didn't have bad luck, wouldn't have no luck at all. I guess those are just the breaks. We say it, that, that, that melancholy, what goes around comes around. I guess it's just my time. I thank God that God can, God can cut across. I said God can cut across some stuff. I preach the word of God, which is we make some choices, and those choices carry some consequences. But while I preach it, I also ask the Lord every now and then to step in and suspend the rules. I know you don't because you want whatever is coming to you, but every now and then I just ask him what I don't deserve. Lord, I certainly would appreciate it. I, I know that I don't deserve this. In fact, I know I deserve punishment, but, but in your grace. That's why sometimes you, you don't understand why people are shouting. Some people are shouting because they didn't get what they knew should have been coming to them. Oh, you, 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 you're still not there. It's early in the morning. Some people, I'm trying to get through this. Some people praise God because God didn't allow all the consequences to come. How about this one? All at one time. David. 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 Come on, a man after God's own heart, is God just scraping the barrel at the bottom of the barrel? I preached through Hebrews 11, and it became the basis of an interesting, engaging study on faith. And one of the prominent people mentioned in the listing what the Christian family calls the hall of faith was Jacob. Now let me tell you what you have to figure out. How God can call the great names of men and women in Hebrews 11. And while you and I are saying, check Abraham. <laughs> check Isaac. Check Sarah. Check Joshua. Check Moses, we get to Jacob, wait, what? God says, yeah, the way I do things is I put unlikely people in places that you never would understand. Oh, you, 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 it, it's too early, but if you really want to find out how God likes to do, th do some things, God puts a genealogy of Jesus, a lineage of our Savior. And he throws in a harlot. I know you're not ready for that one. See, see, God throws a curve to us sometimes. God says, you're looking for a fastball, and I'm going to throw a curve at you. And that is, you will never get the bat off your shoulder because you're waiting for a fastball. You're waiting for a good person to just knock out of the park. And God says, I'll put somebody in Jesus' lineage who is a Rahab a harlot. So that if any people who have messed up hear about Jacob, Rahab, David, Peter, you, me, they'll say there is hope. That's all I'm trying to get to. A man after God's own heart. I, I, I ask this question because I hear sincere believers who get caught up because there is a strain in Christianity, and it is a, a needed strain. It's a strain called holiness. 
But unfortunately, holiness stops at what we wear, how we pretend. It is only for the sanctuary. It never even makes it out to the street. It has the longest dress. It has the biggest handkerchief placed over the knee for fear that someone might look at your short dress. I have a suggestion, lower your dress. Shorten the handkerchief. The handkerchief nor the dress really epitomizes holiness. Holiness is what's on the inside. David is a man after God's heart. Now, 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 I, I think I've made the case, but, but, but God said, no, let me close it out. I said, all right, Lord, it's, you, it's about you. He said, in Psalm 89, you need to tell the people what I said. Psalm 89, I'm through. I have found David my servant. With holy oil I have anointed him, with whom my hand will be established. My arm also will strengthen him. My loving kindness I will keep for him forever, and my covenant shall be confirmed to him. Psalm 89, so I will establish his descendants forever and his throne as the days of heaven. After everybody else talks about you, you ought to have God to talk about you. I said, you ought to have God to talk about you. And let me tell you, God says, David is a man after mine own heart. I'm not up here excusing David. I'm not up here excusing the failures of any man. All of us know that if not for the blood of Jesus, if not for Jesus going to the cross, if not for Jesus dying in our place, if not for Jesus sacrificing himself, if not for Jesus taking our sins, if not for the sinless Savior taking our our sins none of us would be here today but oh I'm glad he's a heart fixer he's a heart fixer he's a heart fixer a man after God's heart I don't want to judge anybody's heart because you and I can only see actions we can't see what motivated the action somebody is real kind to you you don't know the motivation behind the kindness and I would venture to say wisdom dictates you ought to recognize a lot of people, not everybody, but a lot of people do what they do to get a reaction from you. Not everybody, but a lot of people. But I submit to you in closing, for real, that, that David was a man after God's heart. I asked the Lord, why did you put this on my heart, he said, because it's the bend of a life that makes all the difference. I'm concerned because we beat up on one another, not realizing we shouldn't beat up on anybody, but, but, but our warfare is not with another child of God. Our work ought to be leading another person to Christ. The church might have a lot of problems. I'm not talking about one church. I'm talking about the church of the Lord Jesus Christ across the world. You can find some low-down preachers. You can find some, some terrible deacons. You can find some of whatever you want to find, some, some choir members who are sleeping around, and people want to say, well, they shouldn't be singing up there. But let me tell you something. I don't know who's doing what. 
But all I know is without the blood of Jesus. I, I wish I could get a few people who get excited still about the blood of Jesus. Because let me tell you, accolades, what you get in college, what you get at the university, all of those are good things, but they don't tell you anything about the heart. A fella in Aurora, Colorado, shot up that uh, theater, was working on a doctorate degree. We're going to scan for mental health. He, he, he did have some mental problems, but he was also a doctoral student. Some people who had treated him said they were surprised, even though he told them his delusions. And they were writing down all of the crazy stuff he was saying, but they said, he just don't seem like he's crazy. I'm trying to get it across that it's not mental. And when I talk about heart, it's not emotional. It's volitional. David was after God's heart, not, not feeling heart skips a beat every time I think about God. That's good, I ought to feel him. Know all about God, that's, that's good. He's in my head, I can tell you all about him, tell you all about where he came from, tell, tell you all about what he's doing. But, but listen, you gotta have a will. I'm looking for some people who are, who are say, who'll say I'm a man after God's own heart. That means my will is tied into his will. I'm not going to be moved by emotions up and down. I'm going to be steadfast. Help me, Holy Spirit. Heads about, eyes are closed. Lord, thank you today for this word. A man after your heart. Save now. Add to the church. Father, I pray that you would raise up some men after your heart. Some men who will be fathers, men who will be husbands, men who will be persons of dignity, men who will reach out to other men, men who will use their influence to draw another man to you. Men who will be steadfast, unmovable not moved by the slightest challenge, but steadfast in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, the door is open. The invitation is extended. It's all about Jesus. There is a name. The door is open. There is a name. That name is Jesus. Everybody stand. The door is open. The invitation is extended. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There is a name. There is a name. Glory. There is. Glory. Glory. There is. There. The door is open. There is fresh. Bless that name. I need a few people. Oh, Jesus. There is. Hallelujah, hallelujah, the door is open. Save today, Lord, save. Add to the family. There is a name. There is a name. Glory, 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 glory. Open. There is. 
save today, Lord. Draw home today, Lord. Heal and deliver. Oh, Jesus. In the name of Jesus. There is a name. There's healing in the name. Healing. Healing in the name. There's healing. Healing. There's healing in the name. Oh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Healing in the name, precious name, bless the name. Oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. There is. There is a name. Come on, come on, bless him today. Yes, Lord.